are serving the interests of the Palestinian people. We can see it in Afghanistan and in Iraq, where countries are occupied and living under an occupation authority. We can see it in Iran, where the Iranian government is under attack and under constant threat of regime change for daring to express independent self-determination and the will of the people of Iran. So democracy around the world has been under attack by the United States government. And yet nevertheless, from Kashmir to Palestine to Iraq to Iran to Afghanistan to Venezuela to Cuba, the United States government and its allies and its generals have never been able to crush the people's resistance and the people's commitment to real democracy, to real freedom, and to real justice. The people's resistance has continued to live and continued to fight in the streets, in rooms like this where people share ideas, where people talk, and where people build a commitment to carry the struggle further. And they have carried this war that's being waged abroad to a war at home here as well. And that's been the war of detentions, the war of thousands of people imprisoned, the war of people held in Guantanamo Bay as enemy combatants, the war that's been waged on immigrants here, the war of fear that spreads fear in our communities so that people are afraid to go outside, afraid to engage in politics, afraid to speak an opinion, lest the FBI appear at someone's door once again and this time take someone away and let someone get someone else become the next political prisoner. You know, we can see the case right now of Javed Iqbal, who in Staten Island was arrested and is being tried for daring to show Al-Manar on satellite television. And Al-Manar is, of course, the Lebanese channel of Hezbollah. Well, there's a reason why he's being arrested and charged for promoting terrorism, for allowing people to hear an authentic Lebanese voice on TV. And that is because the voice of resistance, the voice of democracy, and the voice of the people that speaks openly is a threat, but it is a threat only to injustice. It is a threat only to power that is wielded with brute force, with Apache helicopters and F-16s, with jails and detention centers. It is a, that is the war that is being waged here at home. It is being waged abroad, and it, will be, and it will continue to be waged until we assert our responsibility. Because when I think of the U.S. responsibility, I can see the government waging war. I can see the government waging war here at home. I can see the, war, the government waging war on people of color. I can see the government waging war on immigrants. I can see the political prisoners held in U.S. jails, the same as Palestinian political prisoners are held in Israeli jails, and the same as Pakistani political prisoners are held in Musharraf's jails. You know, we can see that. So they are going to wage their war on us. But it is our responsibility, you know, people living here in the U.S., whether we identify with the U.S. or not, to join together and to say that we will not be silent, that we will wage our resistance to war of the rulers against the people of the world. It's their war against all of us. But as the people of Lebanon showed, as the people of Palestine continue to show day after day resisting, as the people of Kashmir continue to show day after day resisting, as the people of Iran show, as the people of Venezuela show, as the people of Cuba show, as the people here in this country who have fought for justice for generations have shown it is possible for us to take up our responsibility to resist and to achieve victory not just to fight off their power, that despite their tanks, despite their planes, despite their billions of dollars, we can and will resist and we can and will be victorious and say that we will march until Kashmir is free. We will march until the dictator falls. We will march until there is an end to racism and oppression here in the United States. We will march until no one is illegal and every immigrant is free. We will march until Palestine from the river to the sea is liberated and until every refugee may return home. We will march for justice for Iran. We will march for justice for Iraq and we will march for justice for Afghanistan. Good evening. I'm um, first time I come here but I'm a little bit scared because I don't know what to say, but my mommy told me to what to say. 
<laughs> I like Pakistan, but um, I love Pakistan, and I don't say anything. That's it. Pakistan, Jindabad. <laughs> You see, the young Pakistani American, and we have a student, Mia. Here we are. Okay. Now I'm going to call Mr. Danish Gafur, 12 years old. We have a professor Danish Gafur when I said, but he's not Gafur. <laughs> he said no. Danish Gafur, please come on. Assalamualaikum. Allah is the most gracious, most merciful. I am proud that I am a Muslim. Muslims are not terrorists. Islam is for humanity. Islam means right. God bless all people. We should all follow Islam. Thank you and have a good night. Say that the, the 33 years that I've been teaching at Brooklyn College, which is a long time, has taught me so much about the basic desires of most people in the world, which is to live in peace, to have decent work, to be respected, to have families and to protect their families, and to uh, be in solidarity with other people who share those values. And these are the basic desires of almost everyone in the world, but the people who rule the world. And it's our job to make sure that those values that we share uh, are, um, are implemented, that, they, that, that we see this in our lifetimes and in the lifetimes of our children. So um, my desire and, and clearly your desire is to find ways where average people, working people, the people who are hurt by the global po politics that empower the multinational corporations above us, that we can unite together in common cause. And clearly that is your intent tonight by not only inviting the Pakistani activists but others as well and, and I'm so honored to be one of them. Um, we all know that U.S. aggression kills thousands directly through its wars but it also kills millions indirectly through its policies. Uh, its policies that are carried out by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, that requires that the, the economy of, of every nation in the world be at the service of the multinational corporations and at the expense of the people. I just came back from two weeks in New Orleans and uh, I was uh, I found it very interesting that this was raised in the resolution and I appreciated that very much because New Orleans lays bare for Americans who don't see what you see. Many, many Americans do not see what's going on in the world. They're buying the war on terror. They're buying the idea that uh, the only way American people can live in prosperity is if we rule the world. But in New Orleans, the neoliberal agenda is laid bare. Uh, it, it, move, it, it, it calls for a complete elimination of the poor. There's, there's, there's no possibility of poor people returning to New Orleans, just as there are few, if, if any, possibilities of poor people returning to any of the disasters that occur all over the world. Um, there's a huge destruction of culture, and we see that not only in New Orleans, but we see it everywhere in the world. Uh, the, the last speaker was talking about having a world of McDonald's. A number of people talked about this. That's the desire to do, and then I think that's part of what the attack on, on, on uh, religion is. It's a, it's a way of destroying culture because they, they don't want there to be any sources of resistance to, uh, to neoliberalism. Um, there's a, a, a desire and, and a will to, um, to separate people. To, uh, and in, in New Orleans, is, they're, they're trying very hard to unite the immigrant populations with the African American populations uh, and, and um, uh, to, to say we don't want to be divided and, and the Native American populations. We want to work together. Um, we're seeing that corporate profits is what 
what is in store for all of us at the expense of our people. And that all the social services in New Orleans, and we know that this is happening everywhere internationally, are being privatized. The idea of, of making public services, and we see this in the public schools, you probably experience this all the time. You, you, you starve the public sphere so that the, the public service in, in, in this example, education, is so poor, people don't want to use it. Then they go to private schools because they, they think that they, their kids are going to get a better education. And then people will certainly soon say, well, why should I spend tax money on education, public education, when I'm paying for it privately? So I think this is really what they're looking for. They're looking for all of this, the public services to be basically eliminated and for private corporations to make money in, in selling our services that our government should be providing for us. And this is what they're doing all over the, wor the world. Um, our hope then uh, is to unite together, to create movements and uh, create societies that are based on care and respect for the average person, because this is the great striving of all the religions, all of the people, to live in peace and solidarity and care for each other. And we must inspire each other to organize and to act, to establish freedom, and to join in solidarity together. I'm not sure how you promote democracy, because I believe that democracy comes to an evolution of people arriving at a state of mind in a collective action that determine the outcome and you can't make democracy, democracy evolves. But certainly the United States cannot have any responsibility in promoting democracy because it has no history of promoting democracy. So to expect a country that functions according to the time and the place so that they will play with a uh, democracy, they will get rid of a dem democratically elected individual and put in a dictator because that's what brings profit to this system. You cannot make a partner with that individual, you cannot make a partner with that country unless that country functions from some point of principle and has principles that say that it will only behave in a cohesive, systematic fashion that you can follow not jumping around from day to day being this or being that. So I would ask you if you intend to promote democracy not to believe that the United States can ever be responsible in helping you achieve that outcome. That this represents what we need to continue. Uh, we need to continue to build real solidarity uh, among all of our people. Um, during 9-11, when 9-11 occurred, I happened to be in South Africa at the airport trying to get back to the United States. And I had just attended the anti-racist um, meeting of the NGOs in South Africa. And one of the things that I left with was the fact that all of these people from around the world, from every country, every uh, hemisphere in the, in the world, came together to speak on the issues that impacted on their communities. But the most profound thing is that the crumbs of oppression came back to the United States door from every corner of the world. And so looking at 9-11, the disaster of people losing their lives, what was more relevant to me was the fact that people stood together in South Africa to fight against oppression. And what happened in the United States was only a little cube of pain in comparison to what people have been talking about that they had been suffering for generation after generation. And when I came back, what pleased me even more so was that my sisters and brothers had already begun to organize to fight against the war and the perpetuation of aggression against people that our country was going to be in leadership of. And we also involved ourselves in fighting against the detention of the Pakistani community, people being ripped from their homes, women standing there crying because they did not know where their husbands or their brothers or their uncles had been taken, and still not even knowing where they have been taken. The parallels, and my brothers and sisters spoke about this before, is that unfortunately, 
that is the root on which this country is based. Because if you can take people from Africa and enslave them and bring them over here to use them the way you, you did, if you can take the Native Americans and commit genocide against them so you can steal their land, if you can go to Latin America and the Caribbean islands and Haiti, etc., and exploit the people there because of their land and because of the resources there, it is impossible for anybody in, with any kind of common sense to think that they can expect this country with this oh, history yeah. to be in leadership of democracy. <laughs> the people who are in leadership of democracy are the folks sitting here in this room, the folks who fought against slavery, the folks that fought in Puerto Rico, the people that are fighting in Haiti, the people that fought in Africa, the people that even fought in Europe and other places. It is the people that are going to reinstate democracy around the world. It is not going to be the corrupt governments that are led by people that think that everybody else is to be used up and thrown away, that their land is to be stolen and only used for their interests. It will never, ever, democracy will never, ever be led by those people. And it doesn't matter where there's a Bush, because Bush wasn't back there in slavery. It doesn't matter whether there's a Clinton, because Clinton wasn't back there when they committed gen genocide against the Native Americans. It doesn't matter who's in office if they represent a certain class of people who believe that the majority of the people in the world are disposable, dispendable, and they're only good to work themselves to a bone. And that those people that are in power are the ones who decide what kind of government people have. So what I think is significant about tonight, for me, is that this is another step towards really building the kind of world that we all deserve to live in. It is the coming together of like-minded people who understand what real freedom is about, what real justice is about, and how you get there. Because nobody's going to hand it to us in the UN, nobody's going to hand it to us in the White House or in Congress. It's only going to be taken by the people who have everything to gain by waging a struggle for real freedom and real justice. I want to tell my Pakistani friends that what you saw today, those American friends who were here, I have seen.